and we're live. We are indeed live, Saints fans. Welcome back to another edition of Saints TV Weekly. I hope you're well. I know I'm well on this Tuesday night. Max, how are you? Yeah, doing all right. Um, obviously, wasn't able to be at Gather Round, but uh, yeah, just watched the game from home. I uh, had a lot of assignments, things to do. So uh, yeah, anyway, <laughs> I don't know. There was, it was a bit of a weird game and Four points is four points, and I think that's going to be sort of the mantra throughout the uh, the live tonight. And I know you sort of just forget about that game in 10, 12 weeks' time. How about yourself, Jordan? Yeah, like you said, Max, it's good to bank the four points. Um, you know, you don't look at at the end of the season, you don't look at, um, you know, how you got the wins. You look at, you know, how many wins you have and whether you can play finals or not. Um, so it's very important to get those four points. Me, um, I went uh, went to a pub and washed up with a couple of mates, so that was good. Um, it was nice to get the four points. Um, not nice to see us not kick a goal for a half of football, well, at least up until 30 seconds before the end of the, the first half, and that was a bit, uh, but, um, yeah, four points is four points. So, you know, it's good to get that, good to get that under our belt. Yeah. Um, so just in saying that, we'll just kick off real quick. Mosh, back to your best. Uh, Riley Bonner this week. A um, lot of scrutiny throughout the sort of first two or sort of last two weeks just with his disposal efficiency. Um, 24 disposals going at 92%, a goal, seven marks, and 509 metres gained. Um, did pretty all right, I think, Jordan. How do you think his rebound game was? Yeah, I think he was good. Um, you know, you, you have 17 turnovers. It's hard to... To not respond from that game, um, but his disposal efficiency was was very good this game. Um, maybe the the narrowness of the ground we almost played on a on a damn rectangle. It was so it was so narrow. Um, but yeah, maybe that suited him. I'm not sure, but yeah, definitely looked more confident to the uh, to the eye, and and yeah, uh, the stats stats to back it up. And then we just want to spotlight a few more players. Um... I'll, I'll first of all say Jack Steele, right, completely back to his, his best. Um, no pun intended that. Um, yeah, he's just sort of looked like he's got he, he's got the traits back from 2020, 2021. He had 33 disposals, uh, 10 tackles, 7 clearances, 500 metres gained or 499 just round up, um, 131 fantasy points. And obviously fantasy points isn't the best indicator to tell if you had a good game or not. But, um, yeah, he played... Really well. What do you think of his game, Jordan? I thought he was brilliant. And you know you know why I thought he had a brilliant game, Max? Why? Because he won the he won the coin toss. He did it. <laughs> Jack Steele, every week that we bring it up, Jack Steele is one and oh in weeks in which I bring up the fact that he has a poor coin toss record. So shout out to Jack. He must have listened to me. He must have done training during the week. Um and I'm a bit perplexed that you well, not perplexed, a bit Nervous that you brought up fantasy because in my AFL fantasy league I'm doing quite quite badly at the moment. Um, I just wanted to to share a couple of things, Max, um, from mm-hmm. a from a footy group chat that I'm in. Um, if I can, if I may, um, you this may. was a, a if I may. Oh, thank you. Um, this was a power rankings analysis done. Um, where this person ranks St Kilda eleventh. Um, they won, but another game that was incredibly unconvincing. If Bolter isn't playing and Lynch isn't, then there isn't any glory in holding Richmond to 60 points. A lot less glory in only scoring uh, 68 themselves. Um, what do you What do you think of this? I don't know if it was un like Troy. Like I, I feel like we said this last week as well about um, whoever it was, Connor Rosie or something like that, but. Trey Bolton was the second coming of Christ um, in that game. He had, what, four goals or something. He just looked electric in the first quarter specifically. But yeah. I don't know. It was just two, three years ago, even last year, you probably say we get – oh, maybe not last year. Maybe just – I'll, I'll keep it to the to the Ratton era. We go down or not have the best start to a game where we pretty much don't kick a goal for the first quarter. I know we kicked – memory kicked one 30 seconds or so left in the third quarter. But you don't recover from that. And it was good to see that – I kept saying to – um. Oh, just texting a group chat, sort of similar to what, what um, what you do during the game, but um, yeah, just sort of went in and went. Well, it's only twenty four points. Like it's not like you know Richmond have absolutely destroyed us and put you know forty point margin on onto the game and completely killed our chances. Our, our defense was actually pretty solid. 
uh, with the exception of not being able to contain Shea Bolton. You probably limit that to um, not having like a Jimmy Webster in the team. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think that it unconvincing, yes, but um, if you just base it, uh, sorry, base it off of how we recovered, then I think I'm actually really convinced. Yeah, I think it was a good recovery, um, and that, and credit to us. Um, but it it is a bit worrying the signs to see in the first half. Um, as Ross put it, it looked like there were a bunch of aliens. There were twenty two aliens and St Kilda jumpers all running around. Did you see his press conference after the game? Yeah, I've completely forgot to put an overlay in for that, but we might be able to touch on that just quickly now. Yeah. Is this? Yeah, it was something about yeah. you know at halftime twelve. Like a UFO landed and put twelve aliens out in the pitch. I'm just going, what the hell are you talking about, Ross? But this guy's oh, absolutely. This is what coaching St Kilda does to a man. Yeah, yeah, it makes him literally yeah. go delusional. But that's all right. Um, I don't know. At least you can somewhat see the light in it. And then, um, I guess yeah, like with the exception of probably Josh Battle, um, who I'm glad is that biscuit, biscuit or cake, biscuit or cake. We'll oh, put that away just for a second. Slipping down. Um. Yeah, he had, what was it? I'll just pull up the stats. 25 marks, sorry, 25 disposals, 13 marks. Um, yeah, and 460 metres gained and rounding up. But, yeah, he was he was phenomenal. Yeah, I think this guy, I think Geordie's spot on here. Um, I thought Stocker probably played his best game for the club. I thought he was phenomenal, um, especially he was probably one of the only people that actually stood up um, in the first half. Um, and someone who I also thought was very underrated, Zane Cordy, I thought did his job as well, especially in the third quarter. I thought he stepped up. Yeah, it's interesting because we've sort of done all this and we're still not back to full health. So we're two and two, probably should be three, uh, three and one with that Essendon loss, but that's okay. Um, Cause we'll bring up in a sec or later on in the show, maybe the what reason for that inconsistency, but we still have Dougal Howe to come back. And I know a lot of people, you know, question his form and his, his ability in our team, but he's still the best fullback we've got. And he's still a massive body, um, regardless of what anyone thinks um, or has the opinion of between Cordy and, and Howard. Um, I don't know. We still got Mason Wood and, oh, who was the other one that got injured? Liam Henry. they got to come back into the team. Jimmy Webster isn't injured, so he's been training and he'll be able to, I don't know, pretty much you'd think come straight back into the team maybe a week or two at VFL level just so he's not coming back into that North Melbourne game but like there's still there's still a lot to um to, to sort of unravel throughout the season that we haven't seen our best footy yet yep um we'll go back um and I'll get your thoughts on a couple more a couple more things this is a sort of sliding doors moment um mentioned here if Jack Higgins was in this guy's rolling all Australian last week. Then he doesn't have him in there anymore. Um, kicked two goals too, but didn't bring the pressure that earned him a spot. And there were some great performances elsewhere this week. Um, would you have Jack Higgins in your rolling all in your rolling twenty two, rolling all Australian twenty two? No, I wouldn't have Jack Higgins in yeah. my rolling all Australian twenty two. I, I don't know. It's been really weird because, like, historically, you'd probably put Jack Steele in a rolling. All Australian 22 if it wasn't this year because you've got so many midfielders this year just look like absolute powerhouses. Isaac Heaney's probably the best midfielder in the comp over the four, first four rounds. Floats forward, kicks goals. Petrarca has been really impressive with because I, I usually dislike Petrarca, but I've had to get him in my fantasy team to, for the draft that we did. Not classic. I wouldn't pick Petrarca voluntarily, but um but being sort of keeping a close eye on him and he runs two way or he's seemed to be running a little bit more two way um, up and down the ground. Then you've got like Zach Butters, Zach Butters, Connor Rosie. Um, I don't know. Matt Rao looks unbelievable. Like there's a lot of midfielders this year that just look so good that I don't know, rolling all Australian, even, you know, I know Jack Higgins doesn't play um, in the midfield, but there's just so like, I think the, the, what I'm trying to get at is the, level to which you need to play to be an All-Australian this year is significantly higher than years gone by. Yep. Um, we'll go with another one here. Uh, this is a forward analysis. I've taken the whole the whole team, uh, the sorry, the whole league, um, but looking at St Kilda's one, another exceedingly mild performance. Would you, would you class our performance as mild this week? Uh, the first half was essentially shit, and then the... the Second half was oh, better. Third quarter was pretty good, I thought. I think that was genuinely like a good 
section of footy. We kick six goals, six, and you know, if you a bit more accurate, that's you know, eight to ten goals um, in a quarter, and everyone's going, "Geez, that's a very good quarter of footy." Uh, and then the fourth quarter was just sort of got the job done. But yeah, mild's probably accurate, but not mild yeah. consistently across the game. Like it sort of evens out to a mild. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say whether it was mild across the board, probably not, but over like average. Um, yeah, another another classic St Kilda performance. Um, and this one, this one's not really an analysis. Um, this one I thought was just funny. Um, it was just a reaction to Max King suddenly kicking an amazing goal and and a response me when Queen Elizabeth died. Um, I don't know. I guess I guess you know you might not find that funny. Maybe some viewers found that funny. I did. Um, Anyway, let's just move on. Um, All right. So, yeah, we have sort of just want spotlighted that. And I guess you, you make a good segue. Um, SEN, obviously, try and keep up to date with not what they're talking about as a whole across the AFL board, but um, what they specifically talk about St Kilda. And I've got a clip. Pretty much it's just talking about what we spoke about last week. But if anyone wants to um, oh, see it, uh, I'll play the video now. It's a good win because it would have been a terrible loss. Terrible. It would have been one of those ones that uh, in the end would be the difference between you making the eight or not is that big a win. So their midfield, and everyone's talking about the Adelaide Crows midfield, how it's, it's got no damage. It's vanilla. We called it vanilla a while back, you and I. They're, they're not far off Adelaide's in terms of turning a, a, a one stoppage into a score. They're very poor. They're, they're a blunt knife in there. And I think he needs to look at that, Ross. Too much trust in the same player. So... Uh, Maybe you have to ex- explore Nasiah Wangarini Miller, and maybe you have to look more at Sinclair in there than than, than the stocks that that are in there at the moment, and see if you can get creative. Yeah, so I don't know, Jordan. What what you sort of probably fair call that our midfield's a bit vanilla at the moment. Yeah, um, certainly vanilla. Maybe maybe not even strawberry or or chocolate. Um, and definitely not, you know, like a, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream, Max? No, oh, see, I either love it or hate it. It's mint chip. I, I love mint ice cream. So like some people absolutely love it and, and some people go, that's disgusting. Mint chip should not be an ice cream, but I don't know. That's, that's me. How about you? Oh, no, I'm on, I'm on, I'm in greens with you here, Max. Um, mint choc chip ice cream is the way to go or just regular choc chip is, is also good. Probably mint gets the edge for me. I don't know how you could dislike it, I suppose. Um, maybe you think it tastes too much like toothpaste, but I love it. Anyway, what I was where I was going with this is that a midfield is definitely not mint choc chip at the moment. It's definitely vanilla. I think Kingy just reiterated what we said last week about the set when we were talking about the, um, the centre bounce attendance graphic that you brought up, Max, um, that we just don't have enough don't have enough um, options in the midfield. Um, and I guess it goes back to having a lot of B graders, like what was what was mentioned earlier from Declan weeks and weeks ago that I keep bringing back up because I think um, you disagree with him at the time, Max, but I think each week that goes by, he gets more and more accurate um, that we have a lot of B graders, but not a lot of A graders. So I think that just goes to show again um, that we'd need that genuine star talent. But what did you think of, what did you take away from the SEN clip? Yeah, well, I'm just uh, like as you mentioned. Obviously, we're not going to put this up every single week because you know there's not some weeks it doesn't change a whole lot. But I just, just for your sake, guys, um, the center bounces. Can Jordan? Can you just tell me if you, you can see that? Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll go through um, this website. Under obviously, Jordan loves his his, his squiggle. Um, I've now sort of becoming addicted to this DFS Australia website. Um, Pretty much you can just see all the centre bounces, kick-ins, ruck contests, heat maps. Um, it gives you summaries on everything, and we'll go through a few of those. Um, but, yeah, as you can see, Jack Steele, 86%. That's still really, really high, uh, and I don't think it's necessarily sustainable throughout the course of a 20, you know, however long season, 24-week season, something like that. Um, got Rowan Marshall, the sole ruck, and as you can see, um, below, which I thought was quite interesting. Obviously, you got Rowan Marshall at 91%, and then Michito Owens has made up the remaining of whatever Marshall's not in the ruck for. This week, Mar- uh, Mitch didn't ruck at all. It all went to Caminiti. So you can see the 90% there for Rowan Marshall, 10% for Caminiti, um, which honestly I think is a better a better split. And why, I'll, why I say it's a better split, Jordan, 
it's I think our midfield right now is crying out for Machido Owens more than ever. Not to you know be the the the, the difference maker, but just to see something else go in and see if a bigger body helps Steele and and Ross, or if it you know just sort of does the exact same thing. Like we haven't actually been able to see it yet. Uh, what do you think with that? Um, I just want to clarify um, about uh, the the ruck situation um, that you said Mitch didn't ruck. He didn't ruck. Uh, in the in the center, he did ruck around the ground though. Yeah, but yeah, um, I, I did rucking, rucking around the grounds a little bit. Obviously, yeah. not not um, still not is not what we want as fans. But I think that's a bit better because you're less likely to get injured because um, you're not running at each other. It's just sort of been doing a bit of body work. Yeah, I actually don't mind him rucking around the ground. I think that's good. Um, more involvement in the contest, like you said. But yeah, I agree that Mitch probably should spend some more time in the midfield. Um, Obviously, Marcus didn't play this week and we didn't bring in a like-for-like like replacement. We just brought uh, Max King back in, um, which is why probably that Filippo had such a, a massive increase on his midfield minutes. Um, I personally think that Filippo maybe could benefit from a week or two at Sandy um, rather than than even being thrown in the depths of, of centre midfield. Um, but yeah, I agree with you, Max. I think that Mitch Owens needs to play more time in in the midfield. It's probably a little bit harder without um, without Liam Henry there, because Liam Henry is another half forward option that we can plug in. Um, but mm-hmm. once once Liam Henry comes back, I think that we can we can at least afford to give Mitch Owens more time in the midfield. Um, and I think we we sound like a broken record because we play this, we say that every week. Um, but Caminiti, I thought Caminiti unrelated note, but he actually did quite well on the ruck. Yeah, and I think he's – and just while we sort of wait for Jack Hayes and then Jack Hayes and Caminiti can battle out for that secondary – or it's not even a secondary ruck, it's a pinch hitting ruck, I'd sort of call it, because you're not getting that many CBAs. But, um, yeah, I thought he was ferocious and he, he sort of provided a real chop out for Marshall and you could probably, for the next couple of weeks, if we're going to keep Caminiti in the side, um, yeah, just keep – sort of drop Rowan Marshall to maybe 75%. Um, Ruck and then Cam and Edie have that 25% or whatever it is because Ro- uh, Rowan, Ross Lyon did in his end of game press conference say that Rowan Marshall looks to get looks like he's getting a bit puffed by the fourth quarter. So um, I don't want to bring Tom Campbell in. I just think that we should maybe give a little bit more um, time to, to Cam and Edie at the moment. And then when Hayes comes in, he he's the, the next option. Yep. Um, let's have a look at the injury list. Now, Max, and, and see what our options are. That's a good segue. I believe uh, Jack Hayes is not listed on the injury list, um, so he is possible to come back next week. Do you know, do you have off the top, so I'm sorry, sort of putting you under the, you know, throwing you under the, the bus a bit here, but do you have um, VFL stats for this week? Yeah, uh, you are sort of throwing me under the bus a bit, but uh, no, our VFL team... Didn't play, um, I believe, on the weekend. No. No, they, I believe all the VFL teams just had a buy from from what I can see. Um, and they, they resume next week because of gather rounds. Um, but, yeah, he played, did play. Um, I think we touched on it last week when they played Essendon. Um, I'll just quickly remind everyone of his stats while I pull it up. Uh, that's kind of a – just on the VFL thing, that's kind of um, a bit weird that the AFL didn't allow – teams to to do it because what you could do is you could, if you want to have gather around in Adelaide for those that don't want to travel to Adelaide you could have like more there would be more exposure to VFL games you would think that attendance at VFL level would go higher yeah it's actually a good point um yeah I haven't thought about yeah. it. this is just on the fly but yeah that's that's a bit weird yeah, AFL. Actually bad, bad shout yeah anyway yeah. sorry sorry to cut you off but um yeah Jack let us know if you agree but yeah you know, go on Max Sorry, I just I'll quickly get it out before I I lose it. Um, Jack Hayes, two goals, twelve disposals, uh, and two hitouts. But I believe he was playing as the third ruck behind Tom Campbell and Max Hayes. So the two hitouts was he might have attended like you know two or three um, centre bounces or um, ruck contests around the ground. So yeah, probably another couple of weeks um, for Hayes to probably make his case to return to the side. Yeah. Um, I just want to pull up this comment here from C-Mac. Um, I'm not sure if we totally shut down Dusty. Um, I think he had 30 and maybe he had a, he definitely had like 
25 plus disposals. I'm not sure of his exact stats, um, but I thought he had an all right game. I'm not sure if we we shut him down effectively. I don't think we shut down individual players, and certainly not not Shea Bolton. Um, this is right. That actually ex- that that explains it. That's that's my bad. Um, I did actually know about this, um, but I clearly forgot it. They had a VFL VIX All Stars game against the Sandville All Stars, I believe. Um, right. So yeah, that definitely makes sense. But I, I think it would be best best if um, the VF they just played the VFL. They don't need to have an All Stars game, like you know. With all due respect, who cares about the VFL All Stars and the Sandville? Like you know, I I had heard on Triple M that it was on, and I completely forgot about it right now. So that just shows how irrelevant it is. Um, get more exposure to, to VFL, get more, you know, if you want to have like those, almost those country footy rounds, you could almost turn into that. If you want to play like out in Ballarat and whatever that people suggest or local footy grounds um, as VFL do, um, or even make it even more local, then that's, that's could be a possibility. I would, I would have that than the all-star game, to be honest. Anyway, that's completely relevant. Um, and I've forgotten what we were talking about now. Yeah, like injuries, Jack Hayes. Um, but yeah, no, you probably make a good point. But then going like, because I, I, I agree. Like I completely forgot. I, I don't think I realised until it was over that they played a Sandville versus Vicks game. But I get, I guess if you sort of like, if if you compare and gather around to like the F one or something like that, it's not just the F one or it's not just like the Australian Open that's going on. Like you've got, you know, the under 19s playing, you've got the um if you go to the F one, you've got like the supercars running and then the Formula Three and the Formula Two. So it's not just the one event, I guess, that they just sort of want to put on as much footy as possible for everyone. And um I guess the the sand full versus fix, if if you're at the um if you're at Gather Round is probably a bit more entertaining than watching Williamstown play Frankston or something like that. So I don't know. I, I guess you can see it both ways, but looking from a I guess a marketing perspective, it's I don't know, maybe a little bit. That's probably why they're doing it. They're just trying to put different things out there so everyone's not just watching the same 18 teams play AFL each week. But, no, you make a good point regardless that probably good exposure, especially in Victoria, for, for VFL teams to play a couple of games. Yeah, and just on Gather Round, I saw something that was like the AFL eventually wants to do um, like three Gather Rounds and have it in like – Adelaide for the Victorian school holidays, have it in New South Wales for the New South Wales school holidays and like Queensland for, um, I think, the King's birthday long weekend. Trust the AFL to absolutely milk the hell out of whatever minuscule fun there is just to squeeze every dollar that they can. Um, that is a terrible idea and I would not be a fan of three gather rounds. Max, what are your thoughts? No, uh, see, I... I... I initially had the thought because I two weeks ago I drove up in Adelaide and I was chatting to um the bloke I was driving with and I was like the AFL should do a gather round shield right because in my, like th- this is before all this sort of came to light I'm like a gather round shield makes sense because a bit like the NBA in season tournament Jordan if yeah. you put something on the line for teams that are even lower on the ladder to compete for throughout the season let's say it's maybe a bit of money um for each of the teams and players or you say if you top the it's called this gather round shield, um, whoever wins the gather round shield gets an um, what's it called a place in finals guaranteed, regardless of what you where you finish. Something like that could be really agreed. I know you don't you 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 had me you that. had me when you mentioned the in season the NBA in season tournament, um, which for those who don't know the NBA season is eighty two games long and then they have the the playoffs, but the in season is. Part of the re- contributes to your regular season standings, but there's like um like a fi- round robin playoff and then final series. You don't get guaranteed a spot in the playoffs if you win the in season tournament, but there are monetary incentives to win it. When you said that, Max, I felt I didn't agree with it a hundred percent because I'm not sure how it would operate in the a like with a gather round shield, given it's supposed to be like um. Yeah, um, at most you'd have what three gather rounds, which is a in itself not a great idea. But having someone make the finals just from winning those three games to me doesn't really make sense. Well, see, I wasn't thinking of it as three games. I'm thinking of it as five games. So you'd play Tasmania, Western Australia, um, South Australia, New South Wales, and Queensland. Like obviously, as an idea, 
it to me that makes a lot more sense because you get five games and it goes off percentage. So you've got even like a team North Melbourne West Coast, they'll be playing for something and you know, you won't want to be getting pumped and the teams that are probably a bit more favoured to win, they want to be pumping teams. So you get a bit more intensity in five games of the season. Obviously, it's not a perfect idea, um, but I think something like that is viable. But I don't think three gather rounds is right if it's just to do gather rounds. I think if you're going to do more gather rounds, you need to make like some sort of competition or some sort of in-season tournament to make it a genuinely viable option. The only other place that gather rounds should be, though, if they are going to expand it just as its own thing, should be Tasmania. And I think you should try and get as much buzz for the next sort of five years before the Tasmanian Devils come into the AFL. You want to do one, get the gather round, you know, round four or five, whatever it is for Adelaide, and then maybe, you know, round 16 or 17 in Tasmania, and then all the Tasmanians can get to as much AFL games as possible. Yeah, it, I would have it in Sydney just because of the eastern seaboard, the location-wise, it's accessible for, like, if you're going Brisbane to to Melbourne, that's not, like, that's quite different um, and further away. Actually, is it that much further than Adelaide? I don't know. I don't know. Now that I'm saying it, it doesn't make much sense. Um, instead of the other way, no idea. To get any further. What, what I would have is bring back pre-season tournaments, like bring back pre-season cups. And no, I'm not just saying that because that was the last time we actually won a trophy, but actually bring that back because that was that was kind of interesting. You had like that, that um, you know, the the three teams play in, the, in a single night. You have that, the the nine pointers. That was, that was actually kind of exciting. Yeah, yeah, I don't mind that. I think... To look, because now everyone's so afraid of getting injured. I feel like teams wouldn't actually buy into that as much. Um, maybe maybe the, the teams that are a little bit worse and they want to get um, as many of their draft picks games before round one starts, then maybe. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. There's just – it's such a shame because it's a bit like – the AFL is a bit like the NFL where it's such a demanding – like a physically demanding sport and you can only play really one game a week, full game a week. You can – preseason obviously did it um, a little bit differently where it was – uh, different rules and different times and restrictions and all that. But, yeah, it's hard. And because it's such an awkward time as well, you only play 24 games. Like, there isn't much room for an in-season tournament like there is in the NBA or um, NHL or anything like that because they've got 82-game seasons and then the MLB or whatever has got 150-something. So, yeah, it's hard. It, it's it's hard to sort of expand the game and um, – get as much involvement and more excitement around it when it's just sort of what it is and it's a domestic product. It's not an international product. Yeah. I think just leave gather around. Does it, the, if we go back to the thing that I brought up from SEN or whatever it was, um, just, just have it as one gather around. I think, um, I think one is fine. I think just don't, don't, don't mess with it. It's, it's been around for two years. Like, can we stop, can we stop moving things around? There's already so much, changes that's already happened with the last couple of years with COVID and, and now gather round and, you know, opening round and just stop fiddling with stuff. Like if it, if it ain't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it AFL. Um, but they will do anything, anything for their bottom line. Um, just going to go through a few comments just cause that was a pretty lengthy discussion. Jordan, yep. Mr. DJ Ruboy thinks he, I think he agrees with you. Just wants a longer final series that could include wild cards. Not a bad idea. Um, Raise the idea of getting two SA teams to do derby and gather round. I think that's fair instead of more home games for the top. Yeah, I, I don't know because the two um, well, with gather round, Port and Adelaide do get an extra home game technically on their fixture. I think they get 10 or 11 and everyone else gets nine from what I understand or something along the lines of. But, yeah, I don't know. I guess when it's such a Victorian-dominated sport, you're trying to – Probably gonna, you probably do need to give those interstate teams something so they don't just crack it. What do you sort of think about that, Jordan? Um, I think when you factor in travel, um, that minimises the the impact of of home games by a fair bit. And as someone who's done a bit of travelling, um, I can tell you that it's very demanding. And I wouldn't want to be playing a game of football after you know getting off a, a plane with you know babies screaming behind you. That's for sure. So um, you know, I think the I wouldn't call it Vic bias because it's not inherently the AFL's fault that there are so many Victorian teams. Um, 
However, when you factor in travel, it does play quite a big factor. Um, so I think it's fair that, you know. That's, yeah, they get an extra home game. It, yeah, like that's, yeah. And it also means for that extra game, um, you know, the WA clubs aren't having to travel all the way over to Victoria. So that's, that's a bit better for them. Um, I don't know, like gather around's fine. I haven't been, I would have liked to go this year. It didn't work out the dates wise. Um, I would like to go next year. I think it's I think it's good from from a couple of mates who went. They raved about it. They said it was pretty good. I haven't heard of you know. I've only heard people whinging um, if they play if they're one of the unlucky ones who play one of the Adelaide teams. But you know, the, the world's not fair. Get over it. Um, as as was shown in the the Fremantle versus Carlton game on the weekend. Um, and Max needs to put his ringer on clearly. Um, anyway. Let's let's move on. I think it's time for a, a squiggle jiggle. I think you're right, Jordan. Yeah, it is squiggle jiggle time. As always, for those who who don't know or unfamiliar, I'm just going to leave up the, the. We'll do the who won the round first. Um, so this is the short little explainer. Um, basically, yep. Yeah, as always, if a team does well. Um, a team is ranked higher if it performs well, but also if other teams around similar spots don't perform as well. Um, so basically you want those who are, say, St Kilda's fighting for a top eight, bottom bottom half of the eight position. Um, you want those teams around you, um, like the Bulldogs, for example, um, to, to not have good weeks or to lose. So you're you're more likely to, to finish inside the top eight. Um, and this is what we have... Oh, where is it? I cannot seem to find it at this stage. Hang on. Here it is. Uh, who won the round? St Kilda were ranked the fourth best team in terms of, yeah, fourth best net rating improvement. Um, 7% more likely to make the top eight. Uh, increase of plus uh, 0.8 of a win. Um projected almost 12 wins now um which could be enough to finish in the eight with a good percentage and 105 seems to be a healthy enough percentage um and gain ground against uh, a lot of teams around us um max have you do you think viewers are finally starting to get the who won the round explainer i have i know i don't explain it very well i should probably look into explaining it better um but does that make sense to you sort of at least it makes it makes sense to me because I've done a bit of squiggle myself, and um, I don't know we we tend to talk about it a little bit, but yeah, I don't know. If viewers, let us know if it's all a bit too confusing or if it's I don't know. We've sort of Jordan, I guess, has explained it a bit better, but essentially to dumb it down, really dumb it down. If you win, but teams around you win, it's not as impactful. It doesn't mean as much. Whereas if you win and teams lose around, like teams sort of around the ladder. Um, around you on the ladder lose, then it's a more impactful win. And that's what sort of the scale is. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jordan, or jump in at any point. Um, and then, yeah, it's essentially the same with the loss. Like if you lose, but everyone else around you loses, then, you know, you sort of get compared to that. And if you lose, but everyone else wins, then there's a big gap in sort of how, who wins and loses the round. So I don't know, have I, did I really dumb it down then, Jordan, or is that no, I think you, I think you, No, I think you I think you boiled it down pretty well. I wouldn't have had anything. I think you explained it probably better than I. I just wanted to pull up this comment from Beth. Um, have we stopped writing checks to the New South Wales and Queensland clubs yet? Um, it's funny you say that, given St Kilda is so consistently high on the AFL on the the AFL funding ladder, um, last year, Gold Coast and GWS received $25 million each. Uh, the Lions and the Kangaroos received $18 million, uh, and we received $17.5 million. So we were the fifth highest um, invested club from the AFL. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure about, about those handouts. Um, Beth, I think we also are the beneficiaries of those handouts, to be fair. Um yeah. To be sorry, fair, to... sorry. To be fair, three of those five clubs you named were um, those Queensland and New South Wales teams. Granted, two expansion. I think the Brisbane Lions should be able to be uh, at a point where they're able to fund themselves, especially having the monopoly in um, in Queensland. Re like, really, when you compare it to Fitzroy, they've got the Victorian sort of backing, and then 
uh, the Brisbane Bears collab. Not that there was many fans of the Brisbane Bears back in the 90s, but at least it's something. And then the Sydney, apparently they're the biggest team in the AFL or the um, most supported team in Australia or something like that. I can't remember where I saw that, but don't know how that happens. Um, anyway, uh, they're, they're, you know, I got the South Melbourne backing and obviously you got the, they're the main team in Sydney. So yeah, I don't know. They're two of them at least anyway, should be able to support themselves. I think. I think if you analyzed the amount of people who go to Sydney games versus the amount of people who actually know the rules, um, you would, quite find a, a discrepancy there. So I'm not sure whether they have genuine fans, Sydney, um, at least those who, who come from Sydney. Um, there are obviously South Melbourne uh, expats um, and fair enough to them. Um, but, yeah, I would have thought Collingwood is by far the biggest club in the league. A um, bit more squiggle. We'll just go through it. Um, guys, let me know if you actually enjoy squiggle or not. I know I enjoy it but I probably don't explain it that well and definitely open to some to some feedback as always, whether you want to keep it or not. Um, but this is the projected ladder. Um, Squiggle still has us in 10th. I think it might have been 10th or 11th last week. Um, slightly more wins, but obviously with um, Brisbane and Collingwood winning, um, obviously those teams around us uh, getting getting more projected wins because they obviously that they bank those wins and just quietly Geelong's having quite a good, quite an underrated season. Yeah. It's funny because Joey Montagna said that Melbourne and Geelong weren't going to be the ones to bounce back and yeah, they look like they've bounced back. So yeah, I hate that he is like so accurate. That just shows that he has another level of knowledge that only Jordan and I can dream of. Well, actually, I not to toot my own horn, I had Geelong finishing third this year. Um, I also had GWS missing the eight, so what the hell do I know? Um, yeah, anyway, uh, last one. This is the prediction that Squeal has before the game against GWS, which Max and I will be at. Um, how good. So 62% likely uh, that GWS will win. Um, obviously, I won't I won't get you to do the maths, Max. Uh, Squiggle gives us a 38% chance of, of, us, uh, of us winning. Um, I would think that's pretty fair. I'd say it's almost closer to 67%. Um, Giants sort of home game. They're used to playing at Monica Oval. Um, most informed team in the league at the moment, top of the table. Um, Probably the best team over the last 15 games, if you include the back end of last season, where they only lost like twice in the last 11, including the one-point prelim final loss to the eventual Premier. Um, what do you reckon, Max? Is that a fair... Obviously, you know, anything can happen on the day, but would you say that's a fair percentage? Yeah, it's probably a fair percentage. Um yeah, GWS look at an absolutely flying form. Their midfield's got real solidarity solidarity with their forwards and they're connecting really well. You think someone like a, a is it Callum Brown? Um Callum Brown. Yeah, the yeah, I think it's him and he kicked five goals in the first week. And Jesse Hogan looks like he's back to his his Melbourne Demons form from what sort of 2018, 2019. Um, or maybe it was even before that, 2017, 18, something like that. Um yeah, I don't know. They just look like they're really good and they've got Oh, I always get them mixed up. Is it is it Sam Sam Taylor? That's the one that plays for GWS, and Collins is the one that plays for Gold Coast. Uh yes, sure right? I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Well, without I'll say that without trying to make myself look like a fool, but I think yes, Sam it is. Taylor, I've just I've yeah. just googled it, but yes. Yeah. So like Sam Taylor's um, an amazing fullback, and Lockie Whitfield's injury free. So like they've got weapons all over the grounds, and even someone like uh, Bedford and um Connor Iden, who sort of play Iden's more back. Um and Bedford's sort of that winger, hard running sort of player. But yeah, they've got weapons everywhere and they're really um I don't know, really damaging uh, just about all of them by foot and can really I don't know. If they if we've got to mitigate some of them to really stop that inside work that they do and get the ball to the outside. Cause I think the second the ball's in the outside for them, it's it's game over. Yeah. I think Toby Green also kicked five last week. Um, and to answer Beth's question, unfortunately, Toby Green is available. Um, he only got a fine for that uh, tackle on Mac. I think it was Mac Andrew. Um, and yeah, Hogan definitely gave Cordy a bath last year. 
Um, and I think, but I think Ross Lyons learned from that. And I think the main takeaway was that Callum Wilkie played on Toby Green and Adam Kingsley moved Toby further up the field, which sort of drew Wilkie away and nullified his influence. How do you see that playing out on the weekend, Max? Where do where do you play? Well, do you start him on Toby Green and then if Toby drifts further afield, do you move him and and put him on someone like Jesse Hogan? Or what do you what do you do? No, I'd play um oh, I'm trying to think, because they've also got um 26 Riccardi. So I'd almost put Cordy on Riccardi and battle on Hogan just to really throw a spanner in the works. Cause I think battle um, has a better close down speed than Cordy does. So even if he's giving up a bit of size to Hogan, hopefully he's able to be a bit faster off the line and keep up with him when Hogan's leading. Riccardi um, is that secondary forward. And then I almost put Stocker on um, Toby Green and let Callum Wilkie be an intercept marker. So essentially if jo- uh, uh, Josh Battle is the one on Hogan, he's given up a little bit of size and maybe a bit of strength. You b- bring Wilkie in and you almost double team it. Um, or at least you have Wilkie floating between the contests and he can be a, a true intercept marker. If Toby Green decides to go well beyond the 50, you let him go beyond the 50 because I don't, he's not as damaging up the ground as he is when he's close to goal. So if he wants to get, you know, 30 touches, you know, around the back half of the grounds and not kick a goal or very little inside 50 entries, then that's probably good. But I think if he is going to play Ford Stock as the one to do it because he provides probably that's he matches probably the energy that Toby Green does in terms of physicality. Yeah. Uh, Max, have you got a hot take for us? Yeah, if you were sending your hot takes, my hot take this week is that we'll, f- we'll finally start hearing in in the in the public media, oh, sorry, public media, like uh, traditional media, that Nasai Wanganin Malira is an All-Australian. Callum Wilkie is going to go back-to-back All-Australians because what is it, about round five, round six now? This is when sort of the first team's start getting talked about. Um, and who was the other one I had? Oh, my God. Um, Jack Steele, sorry. I think we start hearing them three names be floated around in the All-Australian squads because this is about the time of year they, they release the first um, yeah, for, first versions of them. Yeah, mine's more so related to the game. Uh, my hot take is that both GWS and St Kilda score over 80 points. Obviously, St Kilda not a high-scoring team. GWS is a high-scoring team. Um, should be good weather. Um, Monica traditionally relatively high-scoring when it's not um, pissing down with rain or absolutely freezing. Um, or it was even snowing one time when they played GWS, played Hawthorne there. Um, I think it was 2019, 2018? Yeah, and Clarko wore the shorts. Yeah, yeah. that was funny. Um uh, this one from Glumnut, Volcanic Take, Hogan kept a zero defence. That would be a tremendous effort. Um, he's probably one of the best forwards in the comp based on pure form at the moment. Um, I think, Max, the focus should be because GWS, I watched them against Gold Coast, at least for the the first half, um, is the – we know the GWS, the, the, the orange tsunami, so to speak. So I've got to, we've really got to be focusing on – on either playing man on man and not not relying on zone because they can really manipulate that and run in waves and also focusing on on kick mark sort of footy when we have the football and not turning it over because as soon as we turn it over they're like that they just go on the wave um they ride the orange tsunami and they take it down the other end for a score um which is yeah, usually a I goal so we've got to focus got to focus on our on our skills yeah i think you're right and sorry not you, Geordie, Geordie Pluto. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, when I mean Riccardi before, it will actually probably be Cadman. I completely forgot they had Cadman. And I think Cordy will be able to do a number on him just because he's, um, yeah, young kid, still number one pick two years ago now. Um, still quite a lean kid. He, he's very much, very similar to how King played in his first season in 2020. Um, just really lean and athletic, but can't put that physical presence on the game yet. And I think... With Cordy, he'll probably give up a couple centimetres, but, yeah, he'll be able to outstrength him. So maybe push um, Cordy to Cadman and then just have, I don't know, a general defender on Riccardi, I guess. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Um, I've completely forgotten what I was going to say now. Um, Do you want me to go through some hot takes while you think? 
Yeah, possibly. All right, Geordie reckons King kicks five on Taylor. Beth reckons Tim Membry to play like a man on a mission. Yeah, it's, I think I think those four, the, the four forwards, King, Membry, Sharm and Caminiti there, I don't know if all of them play um, this week, but uh, yeah, one of them's really, or well, they've really got to put a foot down and say, this is my spot to keep. And um, yeah, they, they know that that's probably the, the hottest uh, position on our, on our list right now for, in terms of competitiveness, who's trying to get it, who's trying to get a game in, I guess our halfbacks as well with Bonner, uh, Naz and Sinclair, but there's no one really in the ranks bobbing up. So yeah, it's, it's probably the, the, key forward for us or the, the medium to key forward player. Um, Timmy reckons King to be a decoy, memory to kick four. Um, can we please play Shaman forward instead of the wing? Well, that's just what I was saying before. There's, you know, you can't have four key forwards in the same forward line, especially with Mitch Owens, who's not going to get dropped, but he sort of can play that, play bigger than what he is. Uh, so, yeah, they're going to really have to compete for their spots this week, and I wonder if we see changes going into the GWS game. John, I'll let you sort of take it from here, unless you figured out what you were going to say before. I have completely lost my train of thought, to be perfectly honest. I was just reading a couple of comments, hoping to remind myself, um, but maybe not, Max, if you want to run through the remainder of the, the viewer hot takes. Yeah, Max King's kicking from outside the 50 to forwards running in. To goal, his last two games has been pretty special. Yeah, I mean, not a hot take, but yeah, it has been. He's been really, really good at it. Um, I don't know. That's the only sort of way I can sort of I can say it. The first three game, well, three games that he's played. Uh, the only thing I say to that though is that we've got the wrong people running in side fifty when King's outside. Right, it becomes Butler and Higgins as the two deepest forwards, which makes zero sense. They should be crumbing, and it should be Membry Sharman. Owens or Caminiti, if we're talking about last week, that need to be the king goes up the ground, someone else positions them forward. Because I'm so sick of us kicking to um, Higgins and Butler one on one inside the fifty. If it's not to their advantage, right? You saw Max King kick it over the top and get Jack Higgins' head from the center square. That was great because everyone was running forward, right? But when King marks it, slows and looks at what the options available are. Why is it Butler and Higgins? as the only two forwards in our forward line and everyone else is running back. It should be Higgins and Butler running back from doing work higher up the ground. And then you've got a genuine marking option in um, Sharm and Caminiti, uh, Membry or Owens, or even Marshall if, if he's resting forward. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's that's, that's pretty fair. Um, I just really want to see – I just – Max, I, I know you – We've already spoken about this a bit, but I really want to see Jack Hayes back. I think it would be very poetic. Um, obviously, we saw him tore his, um, tore his ACL in round five of 2022 against the Giants in this game um, at Monaco Oval. I just really, really would like to see him back. Yeah, and I guess yeah, we saw him in that Brisbane game last year, but that didn't really feel the same. He was clearly just there to give um, – who was – I think King was dropped that game just to make sure he was good for finals. Yeah. And then – yeah, it wasn't quite the same. Like, we want to see Jack Hayes because he was so electric in those first four and a half games. Like, even in the GWS game where he tore his ACL, he kicked a goal from pretty much on, on the paint from 50. So, and I think it's just a great story because it was already an amazing story. He's played his entire, you know, footy at, at, a, at a twos level, essentially, in the Sandful. And then, you know, um, one, I think what was the equivalent of the Norm Smith in the Sandful grand final, he gets picked up by the Saints and then he has 18 and three goals on debut and, um, yeah, to pretty much not play footy or consistent footy for two years and to make an AFL return um, at 28 or 29 years old, however old he is, um, yeah, it would be really poetic. Yeah. Um, I think we might leave it there. Any final viewer comments that you just want to pull up very quickly? Uh, hot take, we need another Ruckman. Owens is not the answer. Yeah, uh, as we sort of touched on before, Cam and Edie played really well, but... Um, Hayes is probably that that perfect option. So we'd probably be throwing pieces and magnets around until Hayes comes in. Um, and, yeah, our, the, the St Kilda story of the last 10 years, I reckon, or ever since that grand final era ended, we have not been able to kick straight. And, you know, I brought in Ruffhead and we didn't want Lloydie to work with Max King and all that, and we still can't kick straight. So I don't know. It's just... Yeah, I don't know how that gets fixed. I guess probably we're too used to playing at Marvel where the elements don't affect you and didn't get to touch on it tonight. But we don't play 
um, back-to-back games at one venue until round 16 where we play two games at Marvel. Then we travel to Adelaide in round uh, 18 and then we play the rest of the games for the fixture at Marvel. Um, so we got a good back half of the year. We get all the travel done now, which honestly I think it's probably better for us. You get whilst you're a bit more fresh and a bit more excitement and energy, you get all your travel out of the way before the buy. You don't get consistency, which is probably what we're going to see. We're probably going to see a bit of up and down probably, you know, by the buy, buyers come, we might be just positive of 50%. We might be just sort of hovering on 50-50 wins and losses. But after the buy, we get full consistency just playing at Marvel and we hopefully turn that into a fortress. Yeah, I think it's like eight of our last nine or seven of our last eight are at Marvel. So, yeah, like you said, Max, if we could turn that into a fortress, that'd be fantastic. Um I think we just might leave it there. Thank you to all those who have tuned in, um, especially the regulars. Um, but thank you if you're if you're new for the first time. Hopefully you enjoyed. Um, you know, leave a comment with your thoughts. Um, yeah, good to get the win on the weekend, and hopefully we can at least move on from that. Bank the four points, move on, um, and we take on GWS on Saturday. I believe it's a one forty five p.m. game, um, and it will be on. Fox footy, not on free to air for those um, in Melbourne. Um, for those living in New South Wales or the ACT, it is on uh, Seven Mate over there. Um, Max, you got anything else to add just before we wrap up? Yeah, as you sort of said, and we didn't do a big reveal because we sort of hinted at it a couple of weeks ago. But yeah, Jordan and I will be at the game. So if you're there, come say hi. Um, I, don't know, I think we'll be around the Hill area, um, TBD with weather and. I don't know, other things and sort of how we go. But, yeah, if you see us or, I don't know, you want to, I don't know, I guess, not stalk where we are, but, um, yeah, just sort of get a, get a sort of gauge if you are in Can- uh, Cairns, Canberra, for where we are. We'll be somewhere around the hill. Um, so, yeah, come say hi and, yeah, always happy to have a chat. So, hopefully hopefully we get the win. But if not, it'd be good to just sort of deflect and talk to other Saners around us in, in Canberra. Yeah. Please go to Canberra and not Cairns. Don't don't make yeah, this. Yeah, go to Canberra, not Cairns. You know, Max, this is completely relevant, but this reminds me. Do you know there is a dedicated area in the Austrian airport for people who booked a flight to Austria who thought they were going to Australia? I did not know that. That's actually quite uh, over a, Over 150 people every year use that. And, you know, every time that, you know, you're feeling a bit insecure or, or you know, not quite as intelligent, um, or not intelligent at all, um, just remember that you're not one of those people. Um, and sorry if you happen to have been one of those people um, that have done that. Um, but hopefully our viewers are not. Anyway, um, thank you guys for watching. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday night and have a great week. See you guys. Go to the Saints. See you guys next time.